today I'm going to be chatting with Stuart White about painting architecture in watercolor. And we're going to be looking at lots of examples of his gorgeous art. And if you don't know Stuart, let me introduce him to you. Stuart White is an award-winning artist and illustrator from Maryland who belongs to or has, has belonged to all the major watercolor, plein air, architectural illustration societies and associations in the U.S. And he has many years of experience as an architectural illustrator and professor of illustration, and he currently teaches and paints at the Easton Art Academy Museum. So let's bring Stuart into the call. There he is. Hi, Stuart. Hello. Uh... Welcome. Thank you, Brenda, for that uh, wonderful introduction. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and so, Stuart, you're looking like a bandaged man. <laughs> yeah, I had uh, dance lessons with a wooden chair, and I tripped and fell okay. <laughs> and and hit my lip. So uh, it's, it's the best makeup job I can do right now. These uh, I don't know why oh, they call man. them flesh-colored, because it... It doesn't look like anything like flesh. No, no, <laughs> so, no, no. Oh well, no. I mean, it's they say a scar gives character to your face. So, yeah, it could be there might be a beard in my future, but if it's not such a an ugly scar, it may just be one of those one know, of those things. Cary Grant things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, um, so uh, today we're going to be looking at your gorgeous art, and I know you are an architectural illustrator and professor, and so I think my question for you is going to be, um, how has your work and your training as an architectural illustrator informed your plein air sketching? Yeah, well, I think it was um, a fortuitous thing for me to get into architecture, because you're as an artist or a young artist, you're always looking for some way to make a living by being a painter. And this actually worked out for me because I love uh, architecture and buildings and uh, construction, but I also enjoy painting quite a bit. And I, I came on to architecture at a time when there was an awful lot of work being done uh, with perspective and drawing and construction and slowly computers started taking that occupation over. And so I kind of wrapped up my career uh, at a point where it was, it was time to, uh, you know, put the, a lot of these things to rest. But now that a lot of people are deciding, you know, we actually like those old uh, illustrations. And then, so there's still quite a bit of that still being done. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So to, to be more specific, what, what it's helped me do is, you know, first of all, get out and sketch people uh, sitting at, at cafes on sidewalks, sketching buildings, sketching how shadows uh, make for stronger compositions. And, uh, you know, so many things about the illustration of architecture and of uh, conceptualizing city planning uh, just forces me to look at how to communicate with images. And that that's the main thing, is to try to communicate with a certain amount of precision and believability that something is actually uh, you know, something that, if you're proposing a building, that the community would actually like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think even after CAD and these computer programs um, became commonplace in architectural, you know, architecture firms, um, you still needed to understand perspective, right? To to use them and to to you know to make these drawings that are believable. Right. I think that uh, you know, one other thing I learned about perspective was there's several many several different ways to construct a perspective, and there's no real you know accurate one because what we're doing is we're taking three dimensional space and yeah. compressing it into a two dimensional surface. Yeah. And in order to do that, you know, things have to sort of, they have to line up, they have to do different things, they have to be believably uh, square. The way our eyes take in the world is we're even looking at the world through a curved lens, and That's then right. our brain puts it all together, that those are all straight, you know, up and down lines, and that when we look up, um, there's all these parallax uh, corrections that we do. And 
by doing that, we we learn to understand the space that we're in. And then to translate that onto paper took hundreds and hundreds of years to come up with some believable uh, construct. And I've seen so many different ones that are just so mathematical on how to get them to be accurate and uh, and they're they're pretty convincing. Uh, but I had I had to learn how to take uh, somebody's plan and somebody's elevation that they drew. Say here's the front of the building, and and uh, figure out how to draw that in space. Yeah. And there, you could how far away do you stand from the plan? How close do you stand where it's no longer you know what effective? And are those random points? You just don't put two vanishing points in there and. And conversion. There's a reason why they're that far apart or not that far apart, yeah. and, and those sort of things. So yeah, yeah. I love perspective. I love perspective. Actually. Yeah, and I teach perspective, and so I'm just like so into everything you're talking about right now. <laughs> like listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, why don't we turn off our cameras and uh, and then we I will share the screen and we'll look at your beautiful art and people today. I have. Um, I only have one screen to work with today. So the, the Q and A's, if you have questions, you can type them in the Q and A box. I'm gonna just see if that box will open up at the same time as I'm sharing screen. I'm not sure. Um, if, the, if, it, if it isn't, if you've asked a question or you have a question, type it in there. We'll pause and I'll check the Q and A box partway through to make sure that your question gets answered. And, and so Stuart, Tell us about this first sketch. This is called Garden Folly. Absolutely beautiful. Um, really lovely. My goodness, with the ladies, it looks like it's from like the 18th <laughs> century or something. They're all in gowns, at, by the looks of it, gowns and hats and so on. Uh, yeah, well, this was a uh, a, uh, a get-together with several other artists in uh, Annapolis, which is about an hour from where I live. And this is a what they call a folly. It was a uh, a tower that's built in the back of the garden. Yep. There's a, a garden wall back there. Uh, I just reason it's called a folly is it, it really has no uh, real function other than a sense of whimsy. And uh, I was uh, sort of captivated by the shadows as it falls across a hexagonal uh, structure. Right. And then there's also intrigued by the sort of uh, bell shape of the of the the roof, and then of course there was a figure dancing, uh, a full sort of flying Mercury figure at the top of that. The figures I made up mostly uh, because this is a a kind of a it would be you, you could put reenactors in there. That's that's what the scene would be. Uh, there is an artist friend of mine with a straw hat. You can see uh, that's Paulden Hamilton back there with his easel and attracting a crowd of onlookers. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the challenge for me on this was the uh, was how to lead your eye into it, which is basically the sort of S shape. There you have a pathway; it goes down, it cuts across. There's a small little Chinese bridge there then then you're uh at the main focal point the first thing you look at of course is that uh, that tower that structure so uh, yeah. uh, the rest of it all sort of uh is there as a compositional aid to to draw you into the picture so um I want to go back to what you said about populating this with reenactors that is an amazing thought <laughs> as an urban yeah. sketcher we're kind of trained to think about um drawing what you see exactly and uh but then you know really realistically people lots of people are painting you know the building that's white in front of them bright pink or they are you know not putting in a bicycle when there was a bicycle so we're not exactly letter of the law painting you know exactly what we see but i've never seen anybody put people in that weren't there before Oh, it's kind of a, you know, if if I close my eyes, you know, I can imagine it, you know, and yeah. I just remember what I just imagined. I think, too, the beauty of our watercolor is that 
I can indicate something without spelling it out. If just a few little moves here and there, and before you know it, it's like, oh, that's a head with a bonnet. And it's, it's really an abstraction, isn't it, when you look at it? And, and there's a figure behind it uh, you know, wearing a pair of tan breeches. And they, but it's really just, uh, you know, I really don't labor on getting the, the details right. I just want to put just enough in there to uh, to suggest something, and then you, you let your own brain fill in the the reality of it. Yeah, and you know, if you think about it, when people are drawing, urban sketchers are drawing a, a city scene, scene, and there's cars in it, and they might put one or two cars in, and then eventually those cars drive away, and they have to do you know an amalgam car or something. <sighs> This is really no different because you could argue that possibly there were people walking across that bridge at some point in time. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. And the point yeah. of it is for scale. Yeah. Um, the the two, the three figures by the tower tell you, oh, it's it's not a giant tower, but it's more or less uh, human scale. Um you could go inside there and you'd ask yourself, well, how do I get to the second floor? And there's certainly that you couldn't get a set of stairs in there, but there is an access to the to the top part of that tower. Yeah. Uh, but and then as a figure is larger in the front foreground in the center, then you get a sense of depth and space um, as you go back. Cool. All right. Let's have a look at the next one. Lovely. So very loose. So you're starting off with a pencil drawing and did you labor much on the pencil part or just kind of, you know, put some marks on a white page? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question about pencils. I, uh, I, I think it's, it's good to have a shorthand of some sort to indicate this is what that is. This is what, what this is going to be. I, I, uh, I really like, to do quick contour drawings of things uh, in a painting like this, where it's transparent watercolor, I need, I feel like I need some guidelines to sort of keep me oriented to what it is I'm looking at. I don't need to put in everything. I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, draw every plank of wood and everything, but I do need something. When I try to paint without the line work, I feel a little bit uh, anxious and lost when I have a little bit of, of a an idea of where I want to go. I feel a lot more confident, confident. I think everybody is like that. I think, you know, if you've got a blank page in front of you and then you put some paint on your paintbrush, you kind of just go, okay, uh, wait a second. It, it, there's, it, there's just something about putting a line down first that really, helps a lot i think yeah and with watercolor you know you want to save your lights um and you don't want to uh, paint over something and wish you had it yeah and this is a good way to say okay remember you're going to want a white chicken right there and you're going to want uh you know a wheel well right there and you're going to want this so don't paint over that you know yeah. so that's just a reminder to yourself <laughs> Yeah. So, and here's something in this uh, painting that I, I've seen a bit, but not much. And that is, looks like you've scratched out some of the paint. Uh, could you repeat that? Here on the left, it looks like you've scratched off some of the paint. Oh, I did. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the some of the paintbrushes come with a chisel end. And if it's a wooden brush, I can carve a chisel of some sort into it. Um yeah, when you got chicken wire or like fine, uh, uh, fine linear work in there, it's a great thing to just scratch in there while the paint is still somewhat wet. Yeah, it's a, and it's you can a also tool. same with the branches, yeah. and uh, you know, back in there, I've got two things going on in this one. One of you got the sort of neutral gray of the chicken coop. And then there's a, a lot of fun color things going on in the foreground and your eyes to sort of lead through that into all the activity going on around the, uh, the chicken coop and the, the way the, the paint uh, puddles, uh, it just creates a certain energy on the page that I find uh, watercolor absolutely 
um, so attractive to to for those sort of things. Yeah, yeah. Well, I just wanted to really point out that scratching, uh, scratching the paint off technique because you don't really see it often, but it is a tool, you know, that's available in our toolbox of watercolor techniques. Yeah, I mean, for your urban sketchers, if you wanted to paint, uh, you know, a window with several fine mullions in there, and you find yourself trying to paint in every pane of glass and try to leave that white of the paper for the mullions, I might just you just paint the whole square. And then scratch in your mullions. And uh, if you want to enhance it with a little bit of white washes, do that too. Yeah, it's good. It's a great idea. And here we have another farm scene. And these are from life, right? You're sitting there in the farmyard? Yeah, this is actually uh, like a wonderful event that happens near here. It's called the uh, Tuckahoe Steam and um, Steam and Gas or something like that. Uh, and there's a lot of old farm machinery on display and uh, it's a two day uh, two or three day event it's a lot of fun but there's some great great mechanical things uh on the site and so i'll just wander around set up my easel and and paint some of these things uh, what i liked about this painting was was a sort of dappling of light on yeah. some of these forms and uh there's there's just you know tractor wheels have always uh, appealed to me yeah, there's something uh, really strong about the those, those tractor treads that that I love and this again is like a big thing with the lost and found edges how a you know a tractor wheel disappears into the ground plane and you don't uh, question it you don't need to know where the wheel ends and the ground begins or where the shadows are I love the way that uh, these forms relate to each other and, and that they uh, the image and the, the mood and the atmosphere uh, can be fired off in another person's mind. If they can see, oh yeah, that's, that's a, I, I'm there. I can see it. Yeah. It's, there's just, I mean, a few shapes um, that have to be clear what it is. And then after that, our imagination fills in the rest, I think. That's right. Yeah. Even though I have absolutely no idea what that <laughs> what that vehicle is on the left there that's orange, but it that has know. more to do with my lack of understanding of farm equipment. <laughs> I think it was a sort of primitive uh, steamroller, but okay. I, I can't swear to that. I just think it, it looked heavy. Yeah. And uh it was, you know, it was a beautiful patina of age on it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think the star of this show, of this image, is uh, are, is the dappling of light on on these machines. Beautiful. No, good comment. Yeah. Uh, this this one is in uh, Georgetown, Wisconsin. Oh, Georgetown, Wisconsin. It's a corner of uh, Wisconsin Avenue and I think K Street in Georgetown in Washington D.C. This is a, an old the Merchants Bank. It's kind of a landmark there. And I, I set up my easel on, on the street there. And, uh, you know, just so it was drawn by the, the shadows falling behind these columns. And I uh, wanted to get something of the gold dome that they have there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, you know, as a composition, this is kind of a... a you know, classic European, you know, a sort of dark foreground and a shadow and people in the shadows uh, frame your focal point, which is uh, right there in, uh, in the bank entrance. And then all these, uh, all these figures are, again, there's a gestured in there when, while they're still wet, you can load it up with a little bit of paint from, you know, this, paint well or that and then uh, as they go back your eye sort of creates a pattern of, of of busyness and activity and the car of course wasn't there for the entire time while I was painting it but I, I could while I was drawing I would gesture uh, this is where I want a car right here and um, you know when you get to it like that's where the architectural uh, illustration came in. I can fake it. I can show that it's uh, it's 
belongs in that very place. And it's uh, somewhat believable. It looks like it could roll, you know, things like that. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think people really, um, I think people learn a lot when they watch these um these interviews where, where where the artist is actually analyzing their own art and saying, look, you know, this here uh, is here for this purpose, or you know, I think it just really helps because you know, if you when you go through Instagram and you click through somebody's art and you just kind of look for three seconds, you click to the next one, the next one, the next one. I mean, it's it is inspirational, but it it, it is also really helpful to hear why did the artist put this. Uh, shape in this spot and why did they do this and why did they do that so thank you so much Stuart I think uh, it's it's really very helpful um so I have a question about the your process for this this image um building first people first in terms of I know the draw you probably drew you know everything um you yeah, know, know. everything in pencil first but when you were painting well that's a uh, that's a really good topic is uh, how do you plan your painting when you start out and uh, I, I basically, I'm usually in, in the sky first, get the top part done and make sure I hold off on, on my light areas and and not to paint over those. And um, even like there's a clock on the corner of above it. It was important to me to make sure I show that little arc of, of light there uh, as the sun is catching the corner of that that clock, because that that little detail, you know, adds a certain a, a richness to the architectural style and what's going on. Same with the highlight on the dome. Uh, I didn't want to. The dome was a lot richer in gold color, but I didn't want to uh, use the color that was in front of me. I wanted to keep things in a sort of a uh, a harmony and not have one thing shout out over the others. The only things that where the rich color comes in is in all the people and the, the entourage of, of uh, trash cans and signage and, and, and those sort of things. Right. Right. Beautiful. Uh, now this one is a really, really quick sketch, which I really, I love like gestural sketches. This is in the, uh, Curacao, yeah, and it is a the city of uh, Willemstad, and there's a lot of these boats down by the the uh, the harbor there, and they're all markets. Here, there's uh, melons and fruits and things like that. It's just a rich, rich, uh, uh, you know, scene. You can just grab a million different things going on there. Yeah. Uh, the architecture in the back is it has a sort of Dutch feel to it because it's a Dutch Dutch colony, but it it's to me I wanted all those buildings to bleed together as as one big shape with just a few suggestions of the style. The rest of it is all uh, you know these lovely shapes interacting with each other in the uh, in the the boats now these this is only intended as a study to do a larger painting which i never got around to doing of course but but i can i can through just this little sketch i can kind of take my mind back to where i was and what was going on and uh and and the whole scene yeah so um do you agree that you know, these paintings that are done quicker, they're quite quick uh, sketches have a, a more energy to them than uh, the ones that are more labored over um, and, you know, detail oriented. Can you agree on that? Yeah, so true. Yeah. So true. And so, but what would you say to people who, you know, who say to you, listen, you know, if I, if I don't take time, if I don't take some time to do something, it's just a big mess that, you know, I, People sometimes say, look, you know, I need some time. I can't do things too quickly or or I'm not going to get anything. That's nice. And, I, and I'll tell you a story. I, I was at a an Urban Sketchers symposium once and I took this workshop with this fellow who was an architect. And uh, he said, OK, we were in Chicago and he said, look at this scene of these skyscrapers and you have 15 seconds to draw them. And I, and 
was like, okay. Um, <laughs> there's not a lot you can capture in 15 seconds. And then he said, okay, now we're going to do it in 10 seconds. And now we're going to do it in five seconds. Well, it, I really didn't get appreciate that very much at all because I really thought that was unreasonable. Um, and, uh, and I teach art, you know, but I just think 15 seconds, five seconds, that's, so at some point, you know, I think people need to take some time. That's my personal opinion, but for people who are trying to speed things up a bit so that, you know, they have more energy in the sketch so that it's not a labored, um, drawing, what, what advice would you give to them? Oh, uh, well, if you are doing a lot of drawing, um, you will, you, you, you'll naturally uh, draw faster. I think the, the thing that in a scene where things are always moving, I think there's an urgency on my part to get, uh, to get things going and to try to just get at the heart of something. Um, uh, I find that the love of of uh, detail uh, is is kind of a will hold you back in, yeah. in terms of trying to get it all. I have uh, uh, I use mechanical pencils, but yeah. once you like, you push something and the lead keeps coming out, and I, I like that because I have to stop and sharpen or anything like that. It has a consistent line, and I feel like the line is part of the painting it's part of the drawing so if i just in that in the center there that's just a pencil window that you just shade it in a little bit it's like, okay done i don't have to paint that window it's there uh there's no more i need to say about that there's again lost edges i don't need to know where that roof starts or where it begins it doesn't have to be exact uh, you know, and these things aren't necessarily conscious. It's only when you look at the painting later, it's a, and you wanted to clean it up a little bit to say, well, why do I do that? It's it's working all right. It's, it's just fine. I don't have to flush it out. And it's also because in architecture, I was uh, required to fill in all the uh, all the edges. I want to know where a big building starts and where it ends. In in sketching, it's not it's not a requirement so it's a, a nice time to uh enjoy my freedom as an artist yeah. <laughs> you know? okay well so you really uh understand um how people where people are coming from when they are struggling to not put you know in all the detail to to just speed things up a bit yes i understand that yeah, yeah. oh yeah. my goodness <laughs> So this one is so spectacular, Stuart, with the strong light dark contrast, which adds so much drama to a sketch. Um, I love this one. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, that is actually uh, the demo piece I did for. I'm going to do a plug here for a video DVD that uh, Streamline puts out uh, called "Painting Architecture in Watercolor," and. What I was was doing on this was basically starting uh, starting from uh, from the blank page is like how do I analyze a an architectural form and how do I draw it and, and how to get the proportions in there and uh, and pretty much knowing when I start where do I want to finish up and there's an awful lot in this that, that came out in the video is where, where do you place figures for example uh how do you draw the eye into the uh into the image how dark should those shadows be and uh, you know how much do you paint how much do you leave out can i glaze can i do layers over a wash that i've already done and uh little texture tricks and things like that so uh it was it was a a fun video for me, a lot of information about how I approach architecture. Yeah. And how can people sign up for this? That's a, a like an online course? Uh, well, Streamline occasionally posts the whole video on YouTube, so you could probably uh, just type that in. Uh, well, I'm sure they'd love for you to just get in touch with them and buy it. <laughs> it's a, uh, a creative catalyst is the uh, the the production company that put it all together and it's called painting architecture and watercolor Stuart white okay
So and you, you would, up, if you have the DVD, it would it, you can break it down to chapters and you know concentrate on whatever subject you want to on on that. Okay, cool, cool. So if people are looking it up, they should do a search for creative catalyst. That's right. Okay, excellent, lovely, Stuart. And now we're going to a much simpler. Uh, yeah, this is what I love about uh, traveling, painting holidays, as they call them, is uh, this is in Provence, and uh, it's near the city of Avignon. And I was uh, doing a, a demo on on uh, being selective on what you paint and what you don't paint. And in this, I was trying to say, okay, my eye wants to go to that door into this uh, chapel or church and I have the jar the door just a little bit ajar that uh, bright orange it captures the, the warmth and the light of that and the rest of it is all there only to to reinforce that focal point so this was a, a yeah so you have a little plan know where you want to go uh, and you know you want to uh, you want to dwell on some of the details that you like and then also, I just create stories sometimes. I don't think that man and the dog were actually there. But uh, I like putting something in there that uh, gives it a story or a narrative. Yeah, yeah. Lovely, lovely, wonderful. Um, <clears throat> I, I remember you were talking about the emotional aspects of buildings and spaces um uh, in our chat before and what what do you mean by that uh i love that question but i think what, what i do think is that uh architecture and i always go love to refer to uh trips to europe but as you can do this in our backyard here in america or in canada is it uh that form light on form can have an emotional power and I do think that um, there is something uh, really joyous about an arcade of arches, the light that's inside of it, uh, people sitting out outside having their lunch or uh, espresso. I think there's, uh, you know, just the way plants hang from balconies and the way light plays on surfaces it disappears it comes back it reveals texture and color and uh and all of that uh i respond to in an emotional way and i can respond to these things in an analytic way but i think with watercolor uh, i can't help but like be delighted in the kind of of uh effects that that you can get with the you know wash you know, wet and wet techniques and the dry brush and and uh the, the sense of of activity and uh you know all of that is just uh you know i think it's just an ideal medium for this kind of thing yeah so well said my goodness i think you've really expressed what a lot of urban sketchers feel about watercolor that you know light on form has this emotional power and Sometimes, you know, you see if you have a strong light and it's hitting a building and then you've got strong um, shadows going across it, you know, urban sketchers, artists will often just stop in their tracks like, hey, oh, I have to paint that. And yeah, right. Yeah. There's this feeling like I have to paint that. I have to paint it right now. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the, you know, there is something about Europe and European buildings that I personally respond to a lot more emotionally than buildings in my own country. And I think it's because here, uh, you know, the architecture that, um, the style that uh, you'll see everywhere here is a lot more modern and it's very simplified and very blocky and, um, and, and a lot of brick, red brick. And, you know, so light hits it and you kind of go, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's yeah. not so, yeah. not so exciting, but in Europe, you'll see, of course, um, this uh, change in architecture. You see all kinds of architecture mixed up often 
um, you know, as, as cities age and change. Um, but the old stuff, you know, some of these buildings, neoclassical building or whatever with the, with the pillars and, you know, there's a lot more detail. And, um, and, and so for, for, for me anyway, and I think a lot of North Americans, we just stop and we stare at that Corinthian column. Like I want to draw every acanthus leaf on there <laughs> because <laughs> it's just like that, that scrolly stuff. It's so amazing. And yet I have seen, um, European artists won't name any names, but um, they just do a real shortcut because it's like, ah, so much detail. I can't draw all this detail. And so they just do a couple of scrolly little things to uh, represent the Corinthian column because it's everywhere and it bogs you down yeah. if, if you're yeah. trying to go fast. Well, I think I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. It was a great topic to me. It's like the, the, the purpose of grand architecture is to make the, the, the people in your society or culture um, feel uh, inspired, you know, to feel like they're part of a bigger thing. If I were to say a Greek living, you know, in, uh, in Athens, and I were to look up at the Parthenon and uh, the Acropolis up there, I'd, I'd feel like, uh, you know, great sense of pride and awe and, uh, you know, the sunlight on that marble is uh is reassuring it's it's warmth it's it's heroic it's uh you know it inspires yeah same with this a little sketch of notre dame is like that it's uh it's not white like that but the sunlight it had been raining sunlight came out it, it just went uh it became you know hugely uh just you know eye captivating yeah and uh and so to, to me, it's like if I'm living in the, you know, the Middle Ages or even to this day, you, you look out your hotel window and and you think it's like that's that's just magnificent. I'm, you know, I'm uh, glad to be a part of all this, you know, human carnival. You know? Yes, it's beautiful. And so you must have been staying right there. Were you in the second floor? I was teaching uh, architecture students about sketching and I was on like the third floor of a of a of one of the the apartments that the university owns yeah great it's, it's great angle fantastic place yeah 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 i've i've sketched this from down right at the river level looking way up and uh but you know you can't the only way you can get this is if you're in yeah a i think it's Pla place saint michel the subway machine uh is right there at the corner and, yeah uh again paris uh fantastic city this is uh from uh montmartre and uh, it's, it's again, it's a study about that um, that style. Uh, Hoffman, I think, is, is sort of that period when when a lot of these buildings were being built. But there's there's a, again there's the play of shadows on the facades and the the uh, the chamfered corner of this building on the right, uh, how it bends a shadow around it and to, to define its its form. Uh, I mean, all of that is just it's wonderful and it would if you're a Parisian you're you're gonna be you know very proud of your city and uh and uh you know I just I think that's the purpose of all that is to uh you know civic pride yeah it, it it's a I mean everyone knows it's an absolutely gorgeous um city so I have a, a couple of questions about this one um, and then we'll, we'll, I'll look and see if we have any Q and A's from people. So if you've got a question that you want to ask, type it in the Q and A box and we'll pop in there and have a look at that in a, in a minute. So a couple of things, shadows, um, do you have sort of a go-to formula for the color, the pigments that you use to create a shadow or is it dependent? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if it's a go-to. It's almost I default to this purple blue. Yeah. And uh, I'll use a touch of, it changes over time, but I, I'll use a touch of that lavender paint that uh, there's a few manufacturers make it. And it's a kind of a milky, well, lavender. And uh, it I can, you know, add that to it. I'll basically... I think some of the best grays are just a play of ultramarine and burnt umber. Yeah. You can go, you can go warmer, cooler, just with those two colors. Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes 
I guess I don't use, you know, any of the ivory blacks or lamp black or, or any of that. Uh, but I, I may use, again, like ultramarine and burnt sienna to get into some of the darks. Yeah. And uh, I do have an imperial purple color, yeah. but I rarely use it. It's more like if I'm, if I've got to have some vivid, vivid color in a, a field of lavender or something like that in Provence, and then it comes through it pretty handy, but certainly there are substitutes. Yeah, yeah. And my second question has to do with um, the birds in the sky. And and so are you a, a what is it called, frisk, fisk? What is that stuff frisket? called? Fr Using frisket? Frisket. Using frisket, yeah. Uh, I hate the stuff. Um, okay, but but there are times when it comes in handy. I didn't use it for this. Um, I think it could be I would uh, leave little air holes and then <clears throat> enhance it with white gouache. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I don't like frisket either. It just tends to bleed all over the place, and you get a blob. For me, anyway. But other people have a lot more success with it. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, a plein air sketch, so it's like it's one less thing to carry around with you. But if I'm doing a, a larger study and I want to get a nice uh, even wash behind an object, then I'll hold back with a, a bit of the frisket. Uh, and that's it's it is handy. Uh, I got to admit it. Um, I try to avoid it. I try to plan without it. Yeah. Yeah. I never use it. I don't like it at all. <laughs> Um, so if you are teaching a, a workshop and you've got a bunch of students around you and you're you're about to, you know, sketch something, <clears throat> uh, you start off with a pencil sketch and do you, do you kind of, how do you approach a, a group uh, teaching class like this, plein air? Uh, with reference to this image or just in general? Just in general, yeah. <clears throat> um, well, I first approach these things with thumbnail uh, sketches and little i have hundreds of these like little tiny things that are not much bigger than a, a postage stamp and then if it looks promising at that small scale it'll probably work very well when you make it large these are on eighth uh eighth inch uh, eighth inch i'm say uh eighth eighth size uh proportions like quarter sheet eighth eighth sheet which would be like oh, a seven by ten right uh, ten by seven in this and then of course the quarter sheet is probably what i'll carry around a, a portfolio full of blank quarter sheets when i'm traveling um but this one i believe it's it's uh no more than an eighth sheet and you want to get like what what first caught your eye and if you can identify that, don't lose track of it. Like that's that's why you're painting what you're painting. And so what what caught my eye was nothing uh, nothing more complicated than the corner of the building on the left and the shadow that it cast down this narrow street. And that's where my eye would go. And then of course I uh, I've got this shocking red of the awning and the and uh, could be uh, a banner or something like that, but that's that's where my eye. That's where everything comes together. The biggest contrast, the color, and the 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 line, the design line, um, all of it comes right there. The rest of it is all an enhancement and is there for balance. Like for example, there is no shadow on the building on the left. There, there's no building there that would cause that. But I put it there because that facade would have made just a big white square with dots in it, which uh, would take away from all the uh, interest of that corner. Okay, um, I can see that. So, so those are things that you say, well, you can, those are the tools, things in your toolbox to enhance what it is you want to do. Same with all the people. Uh, in the foreground, I don't believe there are that many colored umbrellas. Um, obviously, the sun is out. They would have put their umbrellas away. But I love the way that uh, the uh, Ashcan painter Maurice Pendergast would use parasols and uh, 
people's clothing as they're kind of marching in tours through Venice to uh, create this uh, sort of a pattern in really pleasing ways of, of color relationships and shape relationships and line uh, to to create that uh, feeling of, of being in Venice. Yeah. You know, I, I, I know you're an architectural il illustrator. I know that you're very accurate in your work. And I think it's so, uh, it's a great achievement what you've accomplished here in a sketch like this, where you've got uh, you know, blobs basically representing um, window shutters and um, just a, you know, it, it, it must really, you know, good for you. Like it must really be um, a challenge or at some point to go from being super, super accurate to being loose and kind of just uh, making the eye fill in the blank. Um, I mean, I think it's fantastic here, Stuart. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you, you like the style. Um, yeah, I blobs. Uh, it watercolor will do that, and because of the surface tension of the the paint, sometimes it's frustrating because you feel like you're painting with like a little ball of jello, and it won't break down, and so you get a lot of blobby stuff. I'm trying to use a little more of a like squeeze out my brush sometimes and get more of a tooth uh, for for certain things. But that's it when I'm, when I'm teaching. I like to have exercises and how much uh, how much variety of edge can you get with a brush? And um, you know like uh, like a tree, a lot of people might say, well look at all the leaves they start painting little leaves and I think the that's a distraction, which think of a tree as a single organism and it has volume. And so you have a light and a dark and there's uh, there's things you can do to just indicate that it's a tree because we all know it's full of leaves. You don't have to spell it all out, even though it, it may look interesting to you. It can take away from what your main focal point is. Yeah, yeah. So I promised that we would have a Q and A, and then I completely forgot that we were going to have a Q and A. Um, so let me just stop the share for a second, or maybe I can pull it up here. Ah, here we go. Okay, perfect. So um, Perry is asking, how does he? How do you decide the scale of the figures that you add, especially when they aren't really there? Oh, that, that's a good question. How do you decide? It's um, well. There's a lot of little clues that I'll have. Like I'll have to, I know that in a car, most cars or sedans and things like that, most heads come to just about the roof line. And then you crouch down and get inside your car. So if I have a car that I know I could put heads all about the roof line of those cars. If, uh, if I'm on a flat plane, I know that everybody's heads are at the same level as my head. If I know I'm I'm up about four or five stories, I know that I have uh, a horizon line that's above all those things, and I'll know I'll have to find one figure standing next to something to see how tall that is, and I can project with uh, radiating convergent lines to a vanishing point, approximately how big somebody is in the distance or in, you know in front of that figure. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> I think probably they're thinking about you've got this background, you've got you know the, the your buildings or trees or whatever, and now you're putting in an imaginary figure. And so if you put the figure a lot closer, it's going to be bigger. And if you if you want it to be look like it's farther away, it's going to be smaller. And I think she's asking, how do you decide the scale of the figure that you add when they're not really there? So it would be a question of you know, how prominent you want them to be in the, in the sketch, wouldn't you say? Yeah. I mean, again, it's, it comes down to uh, what do I know how high something is and what is a person next to that thing? And that yeah. would be the scale. Now, if, if I want to lead your eye into a picture, I may create a figure that's um, closer to the foreground, but not add a lot of detail. But I know that the next figure that I'm going to put in there, I want their heads heads to be at the same level. If I'm at the same level of that figure, 
yeah. and that's um, that's because it, that's where the horizon line is. Right. And and there, I want to make sure that a figure isn't you know uh, it, it's big enough to walk into a store you know or not you know not too big that they can't get in the store. And so that's where you 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 place those heads or eyeballs all along that line. Right. Again, the study of like being on steps, looking upstairs, looking downstairs, is requires a, a, a bit of familiarity with perspective laws. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you for asking that question, Perry. <clears throat> Jim says, love the comments on what's enough to get your viewers saying the same things you did and feel the things you did as an artist. Such kindness and respect. More comments, please. Oh, thanks, Jim. Nice comment. Not not sure if we can if we have more to say. Do we have more to say on that, Stuart? Um, yeah. Was was that a comment or a question? I think that's just a comment. Yeah. Um, there we go. No, and I'm, Lydia I'm, says, uh, "Do you have a technique for saving your whites or highlights? Uh, do you mark them, or or does does he just do you just remember them?" Yeah, great question. Uh, I, I like to where I, I think the planning of a painting is so important to have before you jump in is to do a, just a small uh, you know, postcard is uh, probably a great size. Just say, this is what I want. And you'll make your mistakes at that point. And you'll know, I'm not going to do that again. And then so when you start the, the, the larger painting, uh, you've already you've already had a rehearsal. Uh, it's why it's why you don't. I always compare doing a painting as to putting on a show is that you have dress rehearsals and you have uh, read throughs and you have it. So you're familiar with what you want to get at the end of, uh, at the end of the day, you want a flawless performance. And the, the more you practice and the more you're familiar with what, uh, what's coming next, like a white area on your painting, that you're uh, you're prepared for, and that's why I use a you know a little uh, a couple of lines with the pencil to uh, to find my way because it does get chaotic. It and uh, the watercolor is nerve wracking. There's no way around <laughs> it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, Virginia says it's always fun to know if Stuart has a, a favorite brand of watercolors and brushes. Does he ever use a water brush? Uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I don't, I don't think I have a favorite. Um, uh, I think the favorites are the ones that manufacturers send me, <laughs> but no, that's necessarily true. I think there's some that I avoid, uh, because I've been disappointed sometimes when I, I'll open up a tube of a cadmium orange or something and like half of it is all medium and extender and binder. And there's just a little bit of pigment in it. Now that doesn't always happen with a lot of the better manufacturers, but uh, I would say I I like uh, Holbein for their consistency of their their paint when it comes out of the tube. Uh, it seems like they figured that uh, that kind of uh, soft buttery is it's got enough extender in it and uh, and filler that it becomes very easy to work with. I, and others have a higher concentration of pigment. Uh, I think Michael Harding is coming out with watercolors. I'm very impressed by them. Uh, Daniel Smith, uh, you, you, if you want a lot of interesting uh, pigment and color, they have an enormous range. It's so overwhelming, actually. But they do have a paint that I like. It's called Moon Glow. It's basically a combination of Viridian and a Lizard Crimson. And it, it granulates and breaks up in a beautiful way. Uh, I'm never tired of experimenting with either paper or paint and doing swatches. Lots of, lots of little swatches to see how one color will react to another. How it looks when you, when you use layers of transparency. And uh, you know how they bleed into each other, and what the viscosity of each paint you know, creates a certain look. Right. Cool. Um, Stuart, she also asked, um, "Do you use a water brush?" A water brush. 
you know what it is? Is it like one of those uh, things you you have pigment inside the handle and you can squeeze them out? You could. I know Le Pan puts yellow. He has like a yellow uh, paint inside a water brush so that it's always clean and in there. But uh, usually it's just it, the um, in the handle of the brush. It's plastic. It's all plastic. Yep. In the handle of the brush, it fills with water. And you can yeah. squeeze it out a little bit so that you're not using, you don't end up needing to carry around a water uh uh, you know, bottle with you, a water cup. Yeah, those are, um, I'm looking at one right now, actually, and uh, I'm, I uh, I don't use them, actually. I, no. But uh, I, I can see how handy they could be. Yeah, and, okay. Uh, I feel serious. like, I feel like water is everywhere, and, uh, <laughs> and, a, and a cup is anywhere, you know, and uh, so I don't never, I ever find myself you know, short of that kind of equipment. But I do think supposing you wanted to make a lot of repetitive marks and you had, say, a, a neutral gray inside one of those brushes and you could dash off, uh, you know, all these little window openings or chimney pots or whatever you wanted to do without reloading, uh, I could see it as a, as a very handy tool that way. Yeah, I mean, it's just a tool, right? So... Um, yeah. Terry is asking, do you ever use pen and ink or do you have a favorite ink? And do you have a favorite ink color? Oh, wow. Yeah, I love pen and ink. Uh, I love the uh, the ink drawings of the like, 19th century illustrators. And uh, there's uh, the work of Joseph Pennell, who did a, a big series of the cathedrals and churches of England and just master of the power of line. Uh I think that uh, I don't have a favorite ink. It's just India ink. And I like working on plate finish Bristol for that. Do you do, you do uh, pen and inks then yourself? Oh, yeah. Okay. I love it for, for, for sketching in, in Europe. Uh, if I'm going to do a, uh, you know, a cathedral, uh, there's nothing like that. The, the look of a pen and ink. I like the the Guptal books on pen and ink rendering, Arthur Guptal. And if you get a hold of you and find one of those, then beautiful uh, uh, introduction to all the different mark making that you can make with your uh, your quill pen, uh, and the different pens that are there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love them. I don't get a chance to do them much. I, I've, uh, and I don't know why, but I do carry them when I travel. And we'll do pen and ink sketches. Cool. But I don't use them in plein air competitions. I don't know why. But I think because it's like you're you're going up against the oil paintings and they they well, look too, they look too delicate or something. <laughs> yeah, it's going to slow you down definitely if you are adding uh, ink to a watercolor or or watercolor yeah. to an ink. And it's um, an acquired taste for collectors. I don't. I think a lot of people are into it. Yeah, yeah, uh, I do it definitely. But uh, <laughs> anyway, Virginia is asking. She says it sounds like uh, you're not using a sketchbook for the work that we're seeing. Rather loose sheets. Uh, I wonder how he then organizes the sketches. Are they framed, bound, or bound into a booklet? Oh uh, yeah, I have a uh, no. I put them all in uh, boxes, and uh, and then uh, I've got some flat files for uh, for sketches and. Things like that, but I I like to if for watercolor sketching, I'm really not satisfied with what's available commercially as a watercolor sketch book. I, I think the paper's inferior. Uh, I I just don't find it very satisfying. So I'll use uh, Waterford Saunders, 140 pound, and I cut them up into eight seat size, seven by ten, uh -huh. and then put them in a in a put them loosely into a a folder that I make and uh, and then you just pull them out. I think there's a advantage of that is I'm familiar with the paper. I know its absorption rates. I know uh, what to expect with it. And, uh, you know, I mean, at the end, I don't have them in a book. They're just in these sort of bound folders right. that you can get. Or you make your own, you know, uh, yeah. easy to make, map right. board, tape. I'm wondering if you've answered the next question from our anonymous attendee. Sheet size 
sheet size. You you refer to eight by ten sheet size. What are these in A four, A two type sizes, or are they in inches? Oh, they're in inches. Um, yeah, they're in inches. I, I'm not. Uh, I'm. I think I know A four. Which is like eight and a half by eleven, but it's, it's similar to that. Okay, so I'm I'm hoping that we can get through all of these uh, questions. Um, so uh, Jackie is saying she says if we can give her quick advice, I struggle immensely with trying to paint more loosely. What types can you? What tips can can you uh, give to help? To paint looser? Yeah. Uh, deadlines. Give yourself <laughs> a deadline. Right. Um, it's like you know you you'll you'll sort of uh, rush over the inconsequential things and then yeah. uh, pay attention to the things that matter. Yeah. Um, and uh, Kate has practice. asked, and I I think we might have covered this already. What's your favorite watercolor paper brand and weight? And you said 140, and the brand was uh, Waterford Sanders. But you know, again, like uh, I like. Uh, Royal Watercolor Society, RWS. And there's another one that's uh, Bao Hong, hard to find, but I'm liking that. And I also enjoy painting on this uh, Spanish paper, but you can't get it here in the States. And you got here, you got to go to Spain. <laughs> and, uh, you know, walk into an art supply store in Europe and then, you know, uh, have some fun with that. But, um, St. Cuthbert's Mill, they make the Waterford Saunders paper. Uh, they have a 140, 300, 200 pound cold press, cold press rough, and uh, hot press. And I, I think it's a beautiful paper. But whatever paper you choose, whether it's Arches or Fabriano, is is uh, you can stick to it so you get familiar with it because they all have different sizing and different formulas and they absorb things at a different rate. So if you can be very familiar with your paper, then that's one less thing you have to worry about. Right. So um Stuart, can you can you you answer the question I think already about do you use fountain pens? We were talking about fountain pens, right? I, I oh uh no actually for for sketching uh no I can't say that I do. Okay. And Monica is asking you to repeat the name of the book. The book that you recommended. Um, uh, a book. So you oh, recommended Arthur Guptill's the... yeah, Pen and Ink and Rendering. Uh, okay. It's Arthur Guptill. He did another one called The Pencil in Rendering. Uh, and it's not about architecture. It's about just about anything, rendering anything. But uh, Guptill is a classic uh, art teacher from like the 1920s, 30s. And uh, very, very good books, well, well written, well illustrated. And so, uh, you mentioned earlier the difference between uh, you, you made you were making a difference between transparent and opaque watercolor paints, and um, it, it sort of made it sound like you use two different palettes. One is opaque, and one is transparent. Use them at, for different situations. Is that right? I would say two different palettes. I would say that. Uh, Colors like lavender or, uh, uh, oh, I would say there's Jean Briand, uh, number two. Uh, well, it's to some extent yellow ochre, it can be opaque. And uh, there's a few out there that are in my palette. And if you load them up, like in this image right now, now uh, I do have some gouache on the people, and then there's this teal green that is probably a uh, cobalt teal light. And that's almost, when you put that in, a thicker, sort of a you know heavy cream consistency, it's going to appear as, as a, an opaque. It'll cover what's underneath it. Yeah. I was just thinking, you know, uh, I'm putting... I'm taking my little tubes, I'm filling my palette, and then they dry into hard little cakes. Um, but if you're painting straight from the tube, likely all paints would be a lot more opaque. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I mean, there, there are certain uh, colors that you can't go too heavy or else you're like, you're, you're starting to work with uh, 
you know, gouache or oil paint. But uh, but yeah, with the with the two paints, you have the whole range of you know very very weak staining of a paper to yeah. something as let's say right out of the tube is is like a, you know uh, a Nutella uh, you know or peanut butter you know and uh, and that's that's your that's your flexibility that's the range you have with watercolor. Yeah, I like this painting because I can see the pencil marks. And I realized, oh, he didn't bother to erase those. He just left them. They're just part of it. Yeah, erasure is going to disturb your uh, paper a little bit. But that's not why I leave them there. I leave them there because it, your sketch is a gesture. It's a, it's, it's a moment in time. It's a happening. It's not a, 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 you know, it's a work of art. Uh, I see these only as uh, something that I did just to um to cement the memory and uh, and then i create a shorthand around it but if i if i get caught up in the, the prettiness of a picture then i i think the the painting loses a lot of energy yeah Stuart, i can tell that you've been painting for a long time how how long have you been watercolor painting uh, i'd probably say on and off for about 40 years yeah it's yeah. amazing when you talk to somebody who's got that that many years of experience it, it's just like um you know you're you're speaking in a different language like you're so familiar with the language and the way you are able to communicate um what you're doing and why you're doing it is um you really can see the difference with a person who's got a lot more experience with watercolor oh yeah we all hate people that say well i just started taking up painting two years ago yeah <laughs> Nobody well, wants. No, to. I don't hate them. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> you've been struggling for forty years. Yeah. Uh, no, it's 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 kind of like uh, I, it's a certain times. This is what I love about either workshops or you know taking uh, painting holidays and uh, having an instructor. Something can sometimes click. This thing you might be have been doing over and over and over for years. And then something might click and then it'll say, oh, oh, that changes everything for me. And you like, uh, you have a certain liberation, you, but you sort of have to get through, you know, the pain of, uh, you know, doing paintings. But at the same time, you know, you're struggling and things are still not quite coming together. Yeah. And, well, it's, and that'll, uh, that'll be that lifetime. That's that's your life. It's going to be that. Of, yeah. It's not quite doing working the way you want to. Oh, my goodness. Stuart. How large is this painting? Because there's so much detail in here. Yeah, that is um, almost a full sheet. Uh, the change of proportions, but it is 28 inches high. I think 22 or 20, probably no, probably 19 across the bottom. But um, I don't, I don't usually work on full sheets. But uh, unless I was doing like you know master plan. Uh, architectural rendering which is not, is not like this but yeah um, i think there's something uh about like all the stuff that was involved there that this works at a larger scale and um you know one, one of the things i do like getting all that thing where my eye is supposed to go right down to the center of the painting and then upward towards the sacre coeur mm -hmm. and on the way there, I have to. I'm caught by the two columns with the Corinthian capitals, uh, but I don't have any all those acanthus leaves painted in there. But <laughs> then you have the, the sort of tympanum of the of the pediment, and yeah. that leads to another form. And there's a, a vague notion of a cross, and then uh, scaffolding on the left. And uh, to me, the activity on the street is a um and the, the signage it you know all of that leads to this sort of the urban fabric and um uh, you know it, it's just what i find satisfying about the painting is is that uh it's it reflects for me the enjoyment i get out of being a tourist right <laughs>
Well, <laughs> what it does for me is it makes me drool because of the gorgeous, strong, light, dark contrast in those shadows that are saying so much. Um, absolutely spectacular, Stuart. Really lovely. Yeah. Well, thank Beautiful. you. Yeah. The I know what you mean about the shadows. It's like, is that they are they they can be put down as a as a single shape and uh, define uh, things that aren't even there. And you think, oh, I, I, it's a window. It's looks. It's got that, but it it's not really painted. It's implied. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely spectacular. Wow, and something completely different. Yeah, this isn't where architecture comes in. Uh, at all, except to say that there's, um, you know, I, I create a movement with with uh, subdued colors to a little bit brighter to going back to uh, subdued colors, and so for that for that reason, there's uh, just a play of the shapes of the lily pads. This was in Texas at a lily pad collector's uh, pond of various varieties of uh of lily ponds it was really fun wow wow beautiful i was thought you were going to say lily pad collectors convention for a minute there well i had several ponds of different species and yeah. uh, a wonderful collection it's in san angelo texas nice and this is our last painting beautiful very atmospheric was this in holland no you would think so by by the windmill, but this is a Sicilian windmill. Yeah. These are salt flats, yeah. And the windmills, I don't know what they do, uh, but uh, they're still there. They're still intact, several of them, and uh, and that big shape in the background is a uh, uh, it's a a hill. Where there's a medieval town and a castle on top of that. It's called Uriche spelled e-r-i-c-e -E. and uh, you can youtube and we'd say you'll you'll just say well when's the next plane out of here i gotta go visit that place <laughs> and uh and uh, but i love this uh the patina on these old windmills and then these various uh various baths of salt and their different levels of salination of how they're how they're making i don't know how they make the salt but you can see that it's an operation of evaporating uh, lots of salt water and uh, turning it into cakes and going from there. They might be using the windmill to grind it or finer or something. Yeah, so it could be that moving, just... whatever. But uh, I, I, I give a workshop. I gave a workshop in uh, in Sicily, uh, a villa called Salonara. It's open to photographers, artists, dancers yoga instructors you name it and uh i found that part of sicily you know really really compelling and uh i had gone there with several other instructors just to have a, a retreat on you know the art of teaching and uh it was a very, very uh fruitful fruitful time yeah beautiful beautiful so uh thank you so much Stuart, for for uh, sharing your gorgeous art with us i'm really really grateful thank you and uh, I think that was very inspirational. My goodness. Uh, wow. Just such beautiful, beautiful work that can be achieved with watercolor. Really lovely. Um, just want to let people know that um, uh, we'll be offering more free interviews and demos this year. We have uh, an interview coming up on January 23rd with the lovely Sebastian Thoman from Ireland called Capturing the Magic in a Sketchbook. And I have another one coming up with Gary Goretz, uh, Glorious Gouache, we're going to be talking about. And uh, there'll be a couple of free demos coming up in the next uh, month or so. So um, if you're interested in any of those things, go to our website, www.studio56boutique.com, and click on the pull-down menu called Free Stuff. Also, I want to tell you about some of our exciting vacation workshops coming up in this next year. We still have tickets available for Edinburgh with Koshi Kuna in July. Brittany, is a new workshop will be launching today uh, with Hazel Sohn in September. The French Alps with Renata Lahal in September. Paris, 
with Stephanie Bauer in September, also Malta. We're going to be going back to Malta in November with Alex Hilkertz. And I'm hoping our friend Stuart here can be talked into teaching a workshop with us sometime soon. Um, so um, thank you everybody for coming and thank you so much, Stuart, for sharing your lovely work. Do you have any uh, final words for people? Well, it's uh, not very, very original, but uh, draw, 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 draw. It's, yeah. it's no, uh, no way around it. And uh, I think I love what you're doing, Brenda, in terms of, uh, you know, sketching a, urban sketchers idea i think it's just a great great way to take in the world uh, particularly our, our urban environments and so uh, well done great thank you so much thanks everybody thank you to all my friends who popped in today and i'm really grateful and i hope to see you again sometime soon bye for now